All right, welcome to another episode of Bright Brains, where we explore the most pressing issues of our time with a wide range of voices. Today, I'm joined by Bibi, a staunch right-wing libertarian with strong convictions about the direction of the United States. As the 2024 presidential election approaches, BB is here to share her perspective on the candidates, the policies, and what she believes is at stake for the future of America. With her deep commitment to individual liberty and limited government, BB offers a viewpoint that's sure to challenge and provoke thought. BB, I'm thrilled to have you on the show today. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, I'm originally from Miami, and like a lot of people there, uh, my heritage is Cuban and Spanish, so I grew up in a very Hispanic area, like nobody spoke English, uh, first-generation American. Um, I I worked in media, I was a production assistant, and I moved into post-production, so that's editing and assistant editing. And then after COVID, I got pregnant and I stopped working. And so now I'm a stay-at-home mom that has a podcast, and I'm also in the process of writing a children's book because I read to my child every night. So I'm inspired. (laughs) So I'm writing a little book. That's awesome. In our email exchanges, you said you actually worked in reality TV. I'm curious, what shows did you work on? Okay, well, the the, um, I lived in New Orleans for a little bit, too, and Mm -hmm. that's kind of like where... uh, where I really fell into the production world. And uh, there was a there was a lot of these uh, run and gun reality shows like following uh, EMS and cops. And one of them was called Nightwatch, if you're familiar. It's on A and E. Yeah, not not that familiar, but I'm guessing it's something kind of like uh, First Forty Eight or something like that. Yes, exactly. They also shot that in New Orleans as well. So I would awesome. they play on that one sometimes. That's like more like uh, when you fill in. But a night watch, I was a regular. So saw a lot of like car accidents and that type of stuff. I was working in production at that time. I wasn't like in post-production yet. So. That's awesome. All right, then. So tell us a little bit about your political viewpoint. So you are a right wing libertarian. What exactly is that? So right wing libertarian uh, to me is Ron Paul, if you're familiar, Ron Paul ran for president in 2008 and he made a big splash. He was like the anti-war candidate. Um, There's a philosophy behind a right wing libertarian that basically uh, encompasses a a non-aggression policy. And um, what that means is uh, basically they believe that the government shouldn't use force And some people take that as far as like taxation is a form of the government using force. They coerce you, they force you to take a chunk of your pay and they do whatever with it. And you basically have no say. Uh, But uh, it means, you know, no war, no death penalty, no abortion. Though some people on the right libertarian side will argue that abortion is um, doesn't violate the non-aggression principle. Uh, that that's a whole nother debate. And then fundamentally, there's a huge concern with the economy. Um, They're very into Austrian economics, which is a school of thought that uh, is um, anti-inflationary. It has to do with sound money. They don't believe you can just print money out of nowhere and uh, support your government like that. Like, uh, like they believe in the gold standard. They believe we should either go back to the gold standard or do some kind of Bitcoin or something where people just can't inflate the entire economy at will because they want some votes or they have some lobbyists that they have to answer to. You know, Congress has just kind of gone off the rails with spending. So that that's a that's pretty much sums it up. Uh, if, if you think of Parks and Recreation, if you've seen that show, it's uh, Ron Swanson, like kind of, you know, very limited government. Uh, what are we doing here? You know, that type of stuff. You mentioned non-aggression. What, what was that again? Non-aggression principle? Yeah, they and, call it the NAP, the non-aggression principle. Yeah. What I thought was pretty interesting, right, is when you mentioned the non-aggression principle, you said it means no war, no death penalty, and no military drafts. You know, I'm independent, but I kind of lean left. And mm-hmm. when I think about right, that's not really a right-wing thing. 
But I can agree with that. I, I don't want war. I don't want death penalty or military drafts. That kind of shocked me because you really don't associate those things with the right. Can you talk about that? Because I'm totally down with no war, death penalty or drafts. Yeah, I think, you know, some people think of the right of like the Bush days when, you know, America was kind of going off the walls with wars and uh, the libertarians call those neocons. So that's like the right wing part of the party that's like, yeah, let's go invade Iran because they're messing with Israel and like, uh, you know, all this stuff. And uh, the libertarians don't believe that the United States should be getting into endless wars and policing the planet. And, you know, we I can't even there were just so many wars all over the place. Like we have military bases all over the place. We spent so much on that. Um, and it's a big part of the problem. And it, of course, goes against a non-aggression principle because it's a very aggressive way to rule. And uh, so the whole philosophy is like we we shouldn't be ruling the world in, a, in an aggressive way. You know, we, we should be peaceful. We should have economic prosperity. Um, so, yeah, there's a very big difference between the neocons and the more like libertarian wing of the right and the left and the right do align a lot when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, for example, Israel, there's like a big fight on the right about that. Like, you know, half of the people are like, you're a Zionist and the other half are like, no, we're not. And the, the left is doing the same thing. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, the the amount of money we spend on all these wars, you know, we have so many problems here at home. That money should go to solving these problems here. You know, why are we giving all this money to Ukraine and yeah. Israel? You know, let's let's cut that out. You know, what 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 are your whole thoughts? And I know this is kind of like an explosive question, but what are your thoughts on the whole Ukraine and Israel situation? It's a mess and it needs to be ended immediately. Like if anything, we need to be preventing the loss of life. Like that's the bottom line. That's the most humanitarian thing we can do. Um, it's it's not like uh, whoever blows each other up the most wins. It should be like, let's negotiate. You know, why aren't we negotiating? Why can't we talk? There has to be a middle ground. I agree. And one of the things with this current U.S. election is I feel like when it comes to Trump and Kamala, there's really no difference on this military spending issue. You know, no matter who gets in, these wars are going to continue. And it's just like, you know, what's the point of even voting in the first place? Yeah, I do think that Trump would try to negotiate something. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, he's friends with Vladimir Putin. But I think, you know, he does that type of stuff because like he's in the real estate business and like war is not great for real estate. So what yeah. works for him kind of ends up working for peace. So like, I don't think he's like the most hawkish guy out there, but he's definitely not the most peaceful. We've had presidents that were really like gun happy, trigger happy, let's say that. Um, the Biden administration has been pretty hawkish, even though they'll like say one thing, but then they like they go and do this other thing. Like, you know, they, they criticize what's going on in Israel, but, you know, they'll go ahead and like spend who knows how much money, like perpetuating the thing forever. It seems like, you know, this this the thing with Israel has been happening like before I was even born. Like, it's just like it never ends. And it's just like how much money are we going to spend over there and like how many people are going to die and why it's like i've never been there this is a part of the world that like most americans have never been to you know what i mean like yeah i'll be honest with you i don't think i can even point to israel or gaza on a map like if you put a map in front of me i, I wouldn't be able to find it yeah but, so you are actually a trump supporter i think you may have been the first person i've interviewed who actually supports the trump is that fair to say are... Yeah, I mean, I would rather vote for him given the alternatives, like, you know, speaking of war, I can't imagine Kamala Harris dealing with Vladimir Putin. Like, mm -hmm. how's that going to go? I don't know. Yeah. Like, I think Trump would definitely cut a deal because he wants to be the hero. He wants to be the good guy. He's a populist. He wants people to like him. And some people don't like that because it's like, yeah, he has a big ego. But with people like that, like, they just want everybody to love him. 
And so if he thinks like, hey, everybody's going to like really like me if I end this war, that's what he's going to do because he just wants to stroke his own ego. You know, so it's like he's kind of real easy. Now, Kamala's intentions, I'm a little bit more confused on. I mean, obviously, anybody running for president wants their ego stroked majorly. But like she's I feel like she's probably just going to continue the stuff that Biden's been doing, which has not been ending any of these wars. So. Yeah, one thing about Trump and that he does not get credit for is that he didn't start any new wars during right. his term. And that was the thing when Trump first came on the scene and they were like, he's going to start World War Three, And he did it. Biden got in office and now it seems like World War Three is kicking off. Yeah. So when Trump first came on the scene in 2016, were you a fan of him or did no. you grow to like him? I didn't vote for him actually in 2016 and I didn't like him because like, I don't like the big ego and all that. And, you know, I didn't think he was like the smartest, like most well-spoken dude. You know, I'd rather, I rather have somebody out there representing the U S that's like, uh, could talk like Obama, I guess. Obama was a good talker, you know, and, and that was nice, but I feel like that was just a lifetime ago. Like now we're just like, on entertainment it feels like almost you know like trump is an entertainer and he is entertaining but i don't know if that should necessarily be politics but at the same time but by this point like it it just feels like theater anyway you know what i mean yeah this whole election cycle feels like uh it feels like a uh hbo tv show you know like (laughs) if i wrote if i wrote a tv show about like everything that happened like say the assassination attempt of donald trump uh, that debate where Joe Biden was like a senile old man, uh, the rise of Kamala. If I wrote that onto a TV show, people would have said it was too over the top. You know, it probably would have got canceled. They would say it was unrealistic. But yeah. well, let's talk. Let's talk about some of these things. So Joe Biden, I'm assuming you're not a fan. I'm not really a fan of him either. But well, what's your personal opinion on Joe Biden? I mean, right now it's just like sadness because it's like the guy's not there. I feel like it's messed up. I mean, they did push him out. He was saying, I'm not going to leave unless God himself tells me to. That was one thing he said. And then basically Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer and like the other big wins of the party were like, look, if you don't do this, we're going to 25th Amendment you. That's what the word is, Um, which, you know, begs the question. Okay, so like who's the president right now? Mm-hmm. Uh, Joe Biden does he like is he cognitively there like not enough to you know the 25th amendment would probably work um it also kind of like Biden's an eye opener too because it kind of shows that in a way we don't even need a president like yeah <laughs> what is this you yeah. know so like <clears throat> he's changed a lot over the years like he's been there forever like he is a career politician and like it's interesting to see how how he's basically shifted with the times and he kind of just goes with whatever. So I, I think Biden is just like textbook politician where he's just going to do and say whatever to remain there, to remain in power unless he unless there's kind of like a soft coup. I won't say it's a hard coup. A lot of people are saying, oh, it's a coup coup. You know, but it, it's not it's not really like he chose to step down but you know there was some intimidation there from the party like do you want to go down like this or do you want to go down like that i'm ike and i'm varum and we're the host of the new podcast odd brains premiering september 1st on patreon join us now for early access to exclusive content that will otherwise not be available until our official youtube launch later this year decriminalized is the first installment of the odd brain series Join us as we chat with an EMS from Portland and San Francisco, Colton Perry of the podcast, Just Dumb Enough. Check it out on Patreon, dropping September 1st, and stay tuned for further updates about additional episodes and other projects to come. You can support the Vagabard Initiative by joining our Patreon and spreading the word. Also, check out www.badproduct.co with coupon code VAGABARD, that's V-A-G-A-B-A-R-D, for 10% off. We appreciate any engagement whatsoever, 
and all proceeds will be used to reinvest into the brand. The link is in the bio below. Yeah. And what's interesting is, uh, you know, he had been showing signs of cognitive decline for a long time. And, you know, I feel like they were kind of gaslighting us on that. And I think when that debate happened uh, between him and Trump, they couldn't deny it any longer. I think that if he had did well during that debate, they would have continued to deny it. But it was just so blatantly obvious that it, it was like, yeah, this is this man is gone. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah it's it, it, sad. It's I mean, that's sad to me. I mean, my dad had dementia and like, you know, to be out there and like in front of everybody just like declining like that, that's it's not a great way to go, you know. Yeah, he it, wasn't like the best guy. There's a lot of like, oh, maybe he did this and that really dirty, nasty thing. But it's still like just on the human level, I didn't messed up, I think. Yeah, it is. Uh, what's your take on the whole assassination attempt? Yeah, that's really interesting because um, it's such a fumble that you wonder if it was like on purpose, like was somebody playing some 4D chess or was it really just like complete incompetence? Um, I, I don't know, like, I don't think we're ever going to find out like for sure what, what was happening there. Cause it's either, it's either the secret service is so incompetent that they let it happen or like they purposely put people in like protocols in place that are going to kind of like allow something like that to happen. Either way, it's kind of scary, you know? Yeah. I think we are extraordinarily blessed that he wasn't assassinated because if he did, this country will be in a totally different state right now. You know, I, I don't even want to think about how what kind of pandemonium would have happened if he had got assassinated, especially because he was on live TV at yeah. the time when it happened. So I just imagine him getting his head blown up in HD, CNN, TV. That would have been would have been wild. And what was interesting was the shooter, he wasn't even that far away. He was like really kind of close. When you look at the little map they put on the news and I'm like, how did they not catch this guy? So it, I kind of think something was some kind of shenanigans was going on behind the scenes, you know? Yeah. It's, and I wonder. I wouldn't be the first time, right? I mean, there's Kennedy, you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of people that, you know, people from within, MLK, you know. Yeah, Bobby. MLK, JFK, Bobby. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's a lot. So what about Kamala? What's your whole opinion on her? Yeah, I mean, like, okay. On the one hand, I think people are being very hyperbolic in general. Like, they're saying, oh, she's like the biggest communist. If we elect her, we're going to completely, you know, die. I don't, I don't think that that's true. I think some of her policies are what I call a grift. Like, I don't think she's uh, being serious when she's saying like, oh, I'm going to pass this or that. Like when it's election season, these people just kind of say whatever, knowing that it's not going to pass Congress, but it's going to get them elected. I think she's doing a lot of that. I also think it's interesting that, you know, there's the elephant in the room that nobody uh, democratically elected her. She was just kind of like put in there. Uh, yeah. And then like on her website, there's no policies. I feel like that's really strange. Um, exactly. So uh, there's something up there. Um, but I think if she did get elected, I think it's totally possible that she could get elected, that she might have a red Congress and she won't be able to do anything because that's kind of usually the way it goes. Like we get a Democrat president and then we'll like have a stalemate because Congress is red and then like pretty mm -hmm. much nothing happens. And there's, you know, that's the checks and balances and that's the beauty. That's why I'm like, I'm not too worried if she does get elected. I don't think it's like literally the end of the world. Um, but yeah, I think Kamala is a little bit of a chameleon, uh, typical politician, you know, that's what it takes to get to that level. Anyway, you know, these people are going to do whatever. Um, the question is, who is she answering to? We don't really know. It's whoever Biden's answering to. It's whoever, like, who's running the show back there behind the scenes, you know, like the nameless, faceless people that are, uh, I guess, um, their uh, cabinet members or something like this, you know, people that are advising them, their advisors. Uh, so, yeah, Kamala, um, Kamala could be interesting. It make for a lot of comedy in a way, too. 
Yeah, you it's know, gonna be funny. Trump is also funny, you, you can do yeah. that a million ways. <laughs> yeah, they both are. And like you said, she has no policy, no platform on her website. What does she stand for? It's right. just people are just voting for her because she's not Trump. Yeah. And because she is a woman and a woman of color. Yeah. Now, you're you're a woman. Do you feel any kind of like, you know, even though you're not a fan of her, if she does win, will you feel any kind of like pride of seeing like a woman in the White House? Or yeah, does that speak I mean, to you at all? Or? I guess in a very superficial level, yeah. I mean, I guess that would be nice, but... I am kind of more of a policy person, but I know that's not the the popular opinion. I mean, I think that we shouldn't have any identity at all when it comes to presidency. Like, I wish we could just like and honestly elect people like based on like what they stand for. You know, I'm I'm kind of tired of like, oh, but it's you know he looks like this and she looks like that, and it's like checkbox, 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 and I I don't I don't think that that's great. But, you know, people don't elect the policies, they elect the person. And that's very clear. Because that's what Yeah, I'm- it seems like people kind of vote for whoever they want to have a beer with, not like yeah. the policy. And right. as far as the identity politics, you know, it, it is something that I think is holding back American politics. People kind of vote because they want somebody who looks like them. But just because they look like you doesn't mean they have your best interest at heart. Yeah. For example, um, you know, one thing that there's been a lot of talk about the last few years is uh, police reform and, you know, reform of drug policy and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she has a horrible record on that stance, especially because, like, in California, she was extending prisoners' sentences just so they could work and get corporate money. And it's like, I thought we were talking about prison reform, but now they put her in there and then everybody just shuts up about it, you know? So it's a psyop. It's a, it feels like a psyop because it's like, save democracy. None of you guys elected this lady, you know? And Mm. I saw a meme that was really funny. It was like, the back, the blue is for the felon. And then like, uh, the abolish ice side is like for the prosecutor. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah yeah which is which is crazy right <laughs> yeah, yeah it is it is it is strange um so and, then her, what, and then i just want to add one more last thing about like just yeah. that topic that like is really kind of peeves me like she knows that like she has to play up being the woman all the way like to get votes so like she's kind of reforming the the hillary i'm with her her thing is just trust women which is mm-hmm. like what are you saying like women don't lie like just trust exactly like that's it yeah yeah and that's another thing i have about identity politics is that it says that if you come from a group that has been historically oppressed then you're more moral or more trustworthy i've been done wrong by women before you know i've been done wrong by black people you know just treat people by the content of their character and when it comes to politicians what are you going to do for me yeah. And you're right about her. It seems like they're running the same 2016 Hillary playbook. It didn't work in 2016, but they seem to think it's going to work again in 2024. It's going to be interesting to see uh, how this is going to work out. So you said you, you're going to vote for Trump, but do you think Trump is actually going to win this time? I, or I think it's so close that nobody knows. Like mm-hmm. Either way, it's not going to be like, we shouldn't be crying guys you know what I mean like people get so like emotionally connected to the president and it's like this is just a four-year term the president doesn't even have that much power really like all they could do is like veto stuff or sign things into law and like by the time anything gets to the president's desk it's like it's had to go all the way through congress it takes like years to implement it's not like like, it is a big deal, but I think Americans make too much of a big deal about the president. They get too, like, emotionally attached. And there's, like, mm-hmm. there's like all this other stuff happening. Like, there's an entire Congress. Like, are you guys voting for that? Are you having, like, that same, like, that fire about, like, who's your senator that's been there for, like, 100 years, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. I feel like people are more focused on the top 
and not like their local elections. And I think it's because the news media focuses more on the federal, the presidential elections than they do on state or citywide, which is that's where the actual change happens. You know, we need to focus on that. Hey, sorry to interrupt. But are you looking to reach a dynamic and engaged audience of curious minds? Well, look no further. Bright Brains Podcast is the perfect platform to showcase your business or product. You'll be able to reach a diverse, intelligent audience and engage with listeners passionate about personal development, technology, and more. Elevate your brand through thought-provoking discussions. Don't miss this opportunity to promote your business on one of the fastest growing podcasts in the market. Contact us today to discuss advertising options and elevate your brand to the next level. Contact us at brightbrainspod at gmail.com to secure your advertising spot on Bright Brains today. Again, that's Bright Brains with a Z pod pod at gmail.com now back to the podcast as a right-wing libertarian what are the most important issues for you in this election well the economy because that affects everybody and then the wars which you know there's a possibility that they can get out of hand and maybe nukes will be dropped i don't know i hope not but we need to do whatever we can to not have these wars escalate to that point because that's the entire world up in smoke that doesn't benefit anybody you know so it's it's pretty important and ending or you know like not letting these things get to that point yeah you know during our email exchanges you said the u.s has been on a devastating spending spree for decades can you speak on that yeah so i mean like the Congress is who's setting the budget, right? And they, it doesn't matter if it's left or right or red or blue, like they spend and they don't care, right? Like they just, if we don't tax it, they just inflate the money supply and pay for everything. So, you know, like the left is like, oh, we just tax the billionaires and that's it, but we're already spending more than our GDP. So that's not it. And then the right's like, oh, just, cut the taxes and that liberates the economy but then we're also just inflating the money supply to pay for everything so it's like either way that's why we're like on this perpetual debt spree like my entire life it's because we're we're just not going to stop the spending no matter who's in power no matter who's in congress because it's not it's not the popular position to actually make cuts so that's yes Yeah, it is. It's it's interesting, you know. So do you think uh, Donald Trump will actually make cuts? And what would you like to see him cut? Yeah, I don't think he will actually make cuts. You know, he'll talk up a talk right now because he wants to get elected. But at the end of the day, you know, he he is a spender. He he, I'm I know he has gone bankrupt several times that that he's he's perfectly okay with it you know <laughs> the united states can't go bankrupt because you just print more you know our our money right now is backed by bombs basically you know it used to be backed by gold and now it's backed by bombs which is you know that's why libertarians are so staunch on like we need sound money because sound money is safer for the world like we can't be extorting the world to use dollars You know, dollars aren't even sound if we're just like printing them, you know, somebody's like just on a computer program somewhere, like just adding zeros. Um, So then we force, you know, like we force these people in the Middle East to give us the petrodollar. And that causes like a lot of problems, um, a lot of wars. Um, So, yeah, the, the, the everything is money. A lot of it is money and and a lot could be solved. The the inflation, like my my husband's mom used to, she was able to buy an apartment in Miami beach in the nineties working on minimum wage. Nobody could do that now. Mm. Nobody could do that. now. Imagine yeah. that like you, your grandparents, they probably own houses, you know, on my generation, very few of us own houses and the generation after us even less. Cause it's like, we're getting more and more and more inflationary. 
And it's just like, when is this, when is this going to end? Like when we're like in an Argentina situation. Yeah, it, <laughs> it is getting bad. And it's like, um, you know, you mentioned uh, in our email exchanges about how it seems like nobody's having babies. It's because nobody can afford it. Right. You know, they can't afford a home. They can't right. afford an apartment. And, you know, people, there's so many people homeless. And I think a lot of people say, oh, well, those people are lazy. I don't think it's lazy. I know I do think maybe drugs play an issue. But I think the main issue now is that you, you just can't really afford anything. It costs $100 just to go outside, it seems. Yeah. And, you know, until we get that under control. But what, what do you think is the cause of inflation? You mentioned about uh, Congress spending money. And you said that uh, it seems like our economy, our, it just seems to be inflationary. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? So, I mean, basically, the, the United States works like a pyramid scheme. So it's like we need perpetual growth to sustain ourselves. It's part of the reason why, like, in my opinion, we're letting in a lot of immigrants because like the way Social Security works right now is like the, the people that are getting money from Social Security, it isn't the money that they put in. It's the money that the people that are working right now is is going to them. So, so you see like the younger generation pays for the older generation. So the population needs to keep on expanding. So like that's, that's the whole system works like that. It works like a pyramid scheme where we need more and more and more people to pay for more and more and more stuff. So, and then like at the same time, yeah, we're not having kids because it's expensive. So it's like, so what do we do? We're also competing with China that has a billion people, India that has a billion people. So what do we do? We let in as many immigrants as possible because we need more people in the system to to keep this whole thing propped up, to keep the, the inflationary money supply that we have propped up. <clears throat> it's more so, complicated than that. But like, yeah, um, that's, that's that is basically the, the way it goes, just to simplify things. So. Gotcha. So as someone from an immigrant background, how do you feel about this whole uh, massive wave of, of illegal immigration? Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, I haven't really noticed it in my day to day, to be honest, because like I'm like I said, I'm from Miami. So it's like it's always been like that. I'm like, what? This is like something new. I, I don't know. I <laughs> it's <laughs> nobody's ever spoke English in my neighborhood. I don't know what you're talking about, um, but you know, you look at Europe and they're, they're doing the same thing. They have the same issues going on. Um, there's a humanitarian crisis and that for sure needs to be dealt with. You know, people do need to be treated humanely. That's for sure. Uh, and uh, it's sad because they're coming from a lot of places that uh, very violent. They, they've got no, no chance over there. Um, and funny enough, and this is part of what makes me right wing, actually, and I think a lot of Hispanics is that most of Latin America in particular, those are all left wing uh, governments. And it seems to like never work. Like it seems like time and time and time and time and time and time again, we try it, we try again, we try it again, we try it again. And it always leads to this like banana republic type situations. I think it's because like left wing ideology allows for... Um, bad people to take advantage of stuff because in good faith people turn over um turn over their their government to people that think that they're going to take care of them and then some some not great person ends up running things and and taking advantage of everybody and taking things for themselves and screwing everybody and but also economically it, it like it rarely ends up working i mean it works in Europe, but they also have more like a, a capitalistic uh, approach to their leftism, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And they're also smaller. A lot of those places in Europe, they have small populations. You know, one conspiracy theory I've heard is that the reason they're letting all these illegal immigrants in is that eventually what they want to do is they want to give them the right to vote. And that mm -hmm. once they'll vote, they'll end up voting left wing. But Based on what you said, you know, a lot of these people come from left wing countries. They might not vote for left wing policies. W what do you think about that whole conspiracy theory? Do you think there's any truth to that or you think it's a bunch of bunk? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I always say that too. I'm like, you guys are silly for thinking that like Hispanics are always going to vote left wing. I mean, look at Miami. Miami's very, um, well, it used to be purple and now it's more red, which is very unusual for a city that big, for a city of like 6 million people to be red. I don't think that there's any other city that's like that big and that conservative. And it's mostly Hispanics. It's mostly Cubans, Venezuelans, you know, Colombia is also left wing and Nicaragua is also left wing and Guatemala and Mexico. And like, I mean, you name it, most of those countries are left wing. So some Hispanics are going to be like, well, it didn't work out back then. So let's, let's try something new. But you also have some Hispanics that are willing to try it again. They think that maybe America just has something different that won't allow it to become a banana Republic, like wherever they're from. You mentioned uh, Elon Musk. You said you would think Elon Musk, if if Trump got in, Elon Musk could get into government and start an efficient commission. Is that something that he wants to do? Does he want yeah. to get into government? Yeah. yeah, that's literally what he wants to do. So like he wants to do to government what he did to Twitter. When he bought Twitter, he went in there and he fired 80 percent of the workforce and people were freaking out. People were like, well, this is, you know, that's the end of Twitter. Twitter's not going to be able to function. Goodbye. Good luck. And then like nothing happened. It was fine. So he, you know, what happens with these like uh, AI tech nerds is that they like they like algorithms, they like things that function, they like to like put their their mechanisms in place. And when things don't really work, you know, they haven't they have an issue with it. So you're seeing a lot of these more um, Silicon Valley types like turning uh, a little bit more libertarian or a little bit more red pilled, if you will, like even Mark Zuckerberg. Um, he's saying like, he used to be a staunch Democrat and now he's like, I'm not, I'm not going to even get into this because, uh, it, it's not, I, there's a lot of reasons, but part of it is that it's a lack of efficiency. So Elon Musk and others, these tech guys are very into efficiency. So he wants to do an efficiency committee for the government, <laughs> which would be amazing. So let's review what we have right now let's see what's actually working where can we really make adjustments cut costs make it work you know if if you're you know the housing authority what are you what can you do to make yourself like as efficient as possible i think that's a great idea because if we're gonna have these programs we need to make sure that they are efficient that they're actually working for people at the very least not just like let them ride and and that's it you know like yeah. What are some things that you feel are not efficient in government, like any kind of programs that you think need to be overhauled or maybe done away with entirely? Yeah, I mean, I think that probably most of it could be done away with, uh, <laughs> to be honest, if we had sound money, like people would take care of themselves. Like, I don't think government is a nonprofit. I don't think government um has everybody's best interest in mind because people get in there and uh, they kind of do things for themselves. You know, I think there should be perhaps a basic safety net, like, especially let's say if you've served in the military or you give back to the community, you're like, you've done something, right? So like housing, housing is a big issue, but I think a lot of that could be solved with sound money. Like if we went back to a place where people could afford a house on minimum wage, that would be ideal. That would take care of a lot of this, a lot of these problems that we're having, you know, with my generation, you seem like you're about my age, our generation and, you know, the younger generations, um, food, food is important. I think, you know, snap is, could be good, but we should be also like, why can't people learn how to perhaps feed themselves like more community gardens, this type of thing. So that's more of like on a local level. I just think that like a lot of these things could like the big issues could be dealt with more like locally. And that would be more efficient instead of like huge federal programs that are like, nobody even knows what's happening there. There's like black budgets that we don't know where they go and things like that. Yeah. Like, you know, a lot of it goes to the military 
And you know, like we were talking about these wars and things like that. It definitely needs to be some kind of overhaul. My thing is, I feel like neither candidate, neither Kamala or Trump, is really going to change anything. I feel like it's just going to be the status quo. And my problem is, it's like I feel like I don't really know who to vote for. Maybe I should just stay home. Maybe I should just vote third party. But uh, let's talk about who is the libertarian candidate for president. You said his name was Chase Oliver. Chase can you Oliver. tell me? Yeah, can you tell me a little bit about him and what your opinion on him is? Hmm, well, Chase Oliver is from Georgia, and uh, I have actually just moved from Georgia, so I had interacted with him before he was the nominee. I was pretty shocked when he came out as the nominee because uh, he's not like the most popular guy in the party, but hey, he won it, whatever he won it. So, I mean, his positions are good. I mean, his platform's all right. But during COVID, I clashed with him because he was for the the regime, the COVID regime, if you will, um, which was kind of unlibertarian. I, so I don't really know like why he was for that. I, you know, it, it was a different time. People people were scared, but uh, so I clashed with him on that. So I don't really like him like that. Um, you know, he's no Ron Paul. I wish he would have been, you know, more of that type. But the Libertarians haven't had a good candidate in a while, I would say. The one before him was very, uh, almost like a left-wing Libertarian. And that, that happens too. There is like a left-wing to the Libertarian Party. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so you said you're not crazy about him. Uh, but you mentioned another candidate, Dave Rubin. Oh, Dave Smith. Yeah. Dave Smith, yeah. Um, so Dave Smith is a comedian. <laughs> oh yeah, I must say, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, he's a comedian, but he's a libertarian, and he makes a lot of sense, and he's really great at laying it out and uh, policies. He's really well spoken, smart guy. Like I think he could have gotten a lot of people into it if he would have been the nominee because. Um, he has that little pizzazz. Uh, I think Chase Oliver, nobody, probably nobody's even heard of him because he's just kind of like under the radar. You know, Dave Smith's a little bit more like somebody that I could see maybe being like a next Ron Paul, like somebody who gets on the map a little bit more, or opens some people's minds to different ideas of how to look at things, how to look at the economy and war and like, you know, the problems we have here, how can we solve them? So... Do you think it's actually worth it to vote third party? I do. I do think so, uh, especially in your local elections, because uh, that's where you can make a difference. I mean, the Electoral College is really who's going to elect the president. So in a way, the the popular vote is almost just a census, you know, because it's mm -hmm. going to be whoever these these people are. And nobody even knows who the Electoral College is, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's pretty... Do you think we should do away with it? Like every time there's an election and usually the left wing candidate wins the popular vote and the Republican will win the electoral college. Do you think the electoral college should be kept around or should we just get rid of it entirely? Yeah, I mean, I've looked into it and it seems really complicated. Uh, I've heard that, you know, the electoral college is there to protect uh, the underdog um and that that could be useful um but i mean it, it is complicated I, i'm not really sure um apparently the popular vote uh, it would it would change things i just don't know we don't live in that system so it's hard to say yeah it, it is hard to say you know I, I really don't know what to think because you know on one hand I'm wary of changing something like this country has been around for so long. And, you know, obviously there's some changes that we made, like one abolishing slavery, giving women the right to vote and things like that. But then there are other things that I'm wor wary of. Like one thing the left wants to do is they want to uh, expand the Supreme court, you know? And I'm like, eh, I don't know. But if, if, if Kamala expands it, you know, say from, was it seven people on Supreme Court? Um, since seven to nine, what's to stop the next Republican candidate to expand it even more? So yeah. I, I just, yeah, I wonder, like, maybe it's not just changing what we have, but actually 
I think I think the American people got to get together and actually stop depending on politicians and uh, the political parties to fix things. We have to really get involved in our local politics and uh, and actually fix things. What do you think is the obstacle to that, though? to actually like change do you think we can the people are actually able to make change at the local level or do yeah. you think it's i think it's yeah. i think it's more possible now than ever one of the more interesting things i heard from like the kind of uh cyberpunk elon musk type people is that we should start using blockchain for voting like why don't we hmm. do that you know we have technology now that's like kind of wild like we probably can get rid of a lot of these quote unquote representatives you know nowadays so mm -hmm. those are interesting yeah ideas. that would be interesting you know i i would love to just be able to vote from home you know the fact that we're still kind of using paper ballots is kind of seems kind of archaic to me but at the same time anything with technology can be hacked you yeah. know they That's say block be like blockchain whatever yeah well they, they say blockchain can't be hacked but i don't know i'm kind of wary I feel like anything, if given enough time, somebody can figure out how to to actually hack it, you know? Yeah. But um, what, what what do you hope? Like, if Trump gets in office, I know it's kind of a toss-up of who's going to win. But, like, on day one, what would you like to see him do? Day one, I want to see him talking to some world leaders and mm -hmm. talking some peace talks, you know? Yeah. Closing some yeah. of these chapters. Mm -hmm. They won. Yeah. Like uh, Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, Israel, Gaza. Yep. And uh, one thing, too, is all these foreign lobbyists and things mm -hmm. like that. We got to gotta get that out of here. Yeah. So one thing, too, is gun control. So you're anti-gun control. Can you speak on that and explain what you, uh, why that is? Well, I think it's a fundamental right. It's constitutional. We should be able to protect ourselves. You know, if you want to get rid of the police, what better way than to allow everybody to have their own protection, if you will. Mm -hmm. Like I've been in situations where I had to call the police and it took them like 20, 30 minutes to get there. And it was like, you know, I needed them a lot faster. If I would have mm -hmm. been able to protect myself, not even use it. Like sometimes just having a gun is enough of a deterrent that nobody's going to mess with you. Yeah, I've heard it say that like the Wild West was polite society because like everybody had a gun, so nobody was gonna be acting dumb. You know, no, you're not gonna you're not gonna talk fresh to some guy or some gal that is strapped, right? Like, yeah, talk that's true. a little different. Yeah, I know. One time I called the police on time and <laughs> I got put on hold, and that was wild to me. I didn't even know that was impossible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. imagine somebody breaking into your house or your car or something and you need the police and you're on hold i thought that was uh that that was kind of crazy but um yeah and people yeah. could abuse their like police power we know that so then what are mm -hmm. you gonna do if they're the only ones that have guns like yeah that's something too you know on one hand the left will talk about abolishing the police and things like that but then you know if we abolish the police and then we also ban guns, you know, how do we protect ourselves? Because if we ban guns, it's only the actual law abiding citizens who will abide by that law. You know, criminals won't abide by it, you know. And, and that's, what, uh, that's what happened in Haiti. I don't know if you know what's going on there, but they got really strict gun laws. And now the oh, gangs yeah. have overtaken the police in Haiti. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I actually haven't been following the Haiti thing too much, but uh I know there was like some gang leader there called Barbecue or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's wild down there, man. Yeah. It's yeah, it, it's getting crazy. Mexico you know, also it, has strict gun laws, and we all know about that. So Yeah, it, it's man, yeah, it's crazy. So I know we kind of touched on the whole immigration thing. What what kind of proposals do you have of how we could like overhaul the whole immigration thing? Do you think well, well let me just what what do you think we should be done about that? I mean, I like the approach of maybe it should be like a sponsorship program. Like maybe mm -hmm. we should have uninvited immigrants coming from we don't know where and nobody to vouch for them. But if like 
you already have family here or you already have a job here or you, you know, you're trying to get married to somebody here that you've been dating online or something like this. I don't know. Um, that, that kind of works. So that's like a, that's a popular, popular libertarian, um, angle. The libertarians are split on the open border question. Obviously you would think libertarians are all for open borders, but, um, some are of the school of thought that, uh, that violates the, the non-aggression principle, because you're basically allowing trespassing. If you just let like whoever come in, you know, to to our public land that we technically that land is all of ours so we're just letting like whoever in that kind of violates our property because it's all of our mm. property we don't know these people and they could be whoever um i think the open borders is also or the, the more open borders they're not totally open has caused a humanitarian crisis because there's so many people coming in and they're like uh you know some of them are have very young children they don't have water they don't have anything to eat like terrible situations people getting kidnapped you know just insanity like really terrible situations so and part of that is because it's like they know it's easy so so the, the families are w- willing to put their their themselves at risk and stuff like this this is this yeah is terrible. yeah it is terrible on one hand it's like i sympathize because they're coming here to escape a bad reality they want to come here and create a better life but on one hand it's like i see so many problems here so much homelessness so much crime you know people not having uh good health care and things like that and i'm like shouldn't we take care of ourselves first you know and that's where the confliction comes in like You know, am I not being sympathetic because me being born here in America, I have a great life compared to people outside there. So, you know, it's like I'm conflicted about that. But yeah, just letting yeah, just letting people in all willy nilly definitely isn't the answer. Yeah. Uh, But speaking of healthcare, I just I heard the other day I didn't know Trump this, but Trump did this. But he he uh, passed the policy that the hospitals would have to disclose how much things are before you get a service. Mm -hmm. I mean that would be great because it needs to be more competitive the more competitive it is the lower the prices are going to be you know that's just that's just what it is if you go to a hospital and they're like yeah an MRI over here is seven hundred dollars you go down the street and the other hospital is like an MRI over here is five hundred dollars you're going to go for that cheaper MRI right like yeah and that that is a great thing and supposedly Biden as soon as he got in office he like cut that Right. Which I'm like, yeah. And what's interesting, right, with this current election is they're running as if Donald Trump is the incumbent when he isn't. He's out of office. All the problems right now we're, we're having is because of Biden. He He's the guy in office. But everything is still focused on Trump, which I think is kind of strange. It's like the left has this like Trump on the brain constantly. And it's like it kind of allows Biden and Kamala to slip through unscathed. Yeah, absolutely. The right is also obsessed with him. And I'm just like, well, guys, you know, there was life before him. and There's going to be life after him. And all these problems are still going to be here. So it's like it's you know, sometimes it just feels like it's his world and we're just kind of in it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. One good thing (laughs) is if he does lose this election, I'm hoping that he'll just kind of go away. And we can kind of get back to normal, yeah. you know, but uh, whatever that I'm, means, I'm, yeah, whatever that means. Yeah. But I think that he probably is going to win. Uh, that That's my guess. Really? Interesting. Yeah. I think he's going to win for a couple of different reasons. One, um, like I said, it seems like they're running the 2016 Hillary playbook again. People weren't enthusiastic about Hillary. I don't feel that same enthusiasm. Most people I know, and I live running like left wing circles, they're not happy with Biden and they don't want Trump, but they're just voting for Kamala because she's not Trump or they're voting third party or not at all. Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like most right wing people, they might not like Trump, but they're still voting for him. And I feel like he might have more people who are single issue voters, meaning they're anti-abortion or things like that, or they're heavily pro-gun. And so they're voting for Trump. Another thing too, is that we discussed that's the electoral college, Mm -hmm. you know, 
And it's just like, he just has so much publicity right now, especially after that assassination attempt. Like I said, I think it's coming down to the wire. If you watch liberal media, they all say Kamala's in the lead. If you watch conservative media, they all say Trump is in the lead. We're not really going to know who's going to win this thing until the day of the election or maybe a couple days after. Who knows? One thing I wanted to touch on is you said some of Kamala's ideas like taxing unrealized capital gains is a grift. What is an unrealized capital gain and how is it a grift? To so tax basically, it? it's it's so ridiculous because it's like, OK, <clears throat> you own a property, right? That property goes up in value. You haven't sold it yet, okay? They want to tax that that unrealized gain, meaning you haven't sold the asset yet, but it went up X amount of dollars. It's usually applies to the stocks, though. Like you know, Kamala, I'm sure has a ton of money in stocks. All these politicians do. That's what you know. All the insider trading and all this and this and that. Um, so they all live off of capital gains you know, they all have unrealized capital gains. So I think it is a total grift because that's how they make their money too. And it doesn't even make sense because it's like the market's always going up and down. How, what, when exactly at one point would you be like, oh, your Apple stocks went up like 20%. So we're, now we're going to tax you on it. And then like the next day it goes down like 10%. Like it just doesn't make, doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Another thing she wants to do is add ten trillion for climate change or for the environment. And don't get me wrong, I believe climate change is a real thing and it's something we need to tackle. But you know, spending ten trillion, I don't know where that money's gonna come from and how they're gonna do it. Right. So And usually what that means is like, oh yeah, let's give China like and India a bunch of money and hope that they will comply with like uh our, our agreements and they never do you know like china and india they they pollute a lot more than us mm. you know that that i think is going to be dealt with like with the elon musks of the world like random people that are going to figure it out and be like look i made this killer car you know you can buy it i'm going to make a cheaper killer car it doesn't have to be gas powered it could be electric you know let's start making solar power on everybody's roofs affordable things like this yeah, that's when I that's when I originally became a fan of Elon. I'm not so much a fan of him anymore, but when he first came on the scene, it's like the whole electric cars. He also had a company selling solar panels. And, you know, I feel like solar panel technology, I'm like, why aren't we more investing in that? Why aren't we more investing in green technologies and doing something about that? But I don't I don't think either Republicans or Democrats actually want to do anything about climate. I think they just want to make as much money and, you know, protect themselves and people be down. The worst thing for the climate would be if we had a nuclear war. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, <laughs> nuclear war would definitely, you know, <laughs> that would change the climate right then and there. Overnight, yeah. yeah. I don't want that either. I just want to say, like, I understand not liking Elon 100%. The Neuralink thing sounds really sketchy, but I understand from his perspective why he wants to do it. He is in bed with the government also, with the government contracts and all this and that. You know, he's a business guy. He's not a saint, but, you know, maybe maybe he'll do some stuff to be liked and stroke his ego. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Let's say your ideal candidate gets elected. And they ask you, they say, whatever you want me to do, you can name one thing and I'll do it. What would that one thing be? Oh, boy. Well, that's such a good question. <clears throat> do one thing. Well, I guess I would have to give the textbook libertarian answer, which is end the Federal Reserve and the Fed. Mm -hmm. That's like a typical libertarian thing. So let's say yeah. the Fed. The gotcha. federal, that means Federal Reserve, not the entire federal government. But. All right. Yeah, I'm down with that. You know, the thing about the Federal Reserve is I, I'm thinking I'm getting this right. They lend the money to us and we have to pay it back to them in interest. Right. And yeah. we don't own the Fed. Yeah, it's like a third party kind of thing. Which... It's public and private. Nobody knows. And that's why everything is based on debt. That's why I'm saying like the whole thing works like a pyramid scheme. Like you need 
to be in debt to get a credit score. You need, you know, they want to, you want, they want you to go to college and get into debt. And then you get a mortgage, you get into debt. And it like, it all pay, pays into the Federal Reserve. And it's like, it works like a pyramid scheme. Yeah. And that debt is what keeps us in check. It's kind of like, yeah. you know, we're wage slaves. We're, yeah. we're in debt and they want us to just, you know, work until we die. Yep. Um, yeah. Hey, this has been a great conversation. I learned a lot. And I, uh, I you know, it's always good to connect with people from across the aisle and, uh, and actually sit down and have discussions. Before I let you go, is there anything you have that you want to promote? Um, sure. Check out my podcast. It's called Beyond the Seven Kingdoms. And uh, we talk politics over there, uh, trying to have uh, different guests from all points of views and backgrounds. So I, I like talking to people and, you know, getting to know what random Americans think. So check us out there. Awesome. All right, then. This has been a great talk. You take care and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. All right. You too. All right. That's a wrap. Thank you for joining us for another enlightening conversation here on Bright Brains. I hope you've gained valuable insights and inspiration to heal your own bright ideas. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to like and subscribe, rate, and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform or however else you listen to this podcast. Also, we can be found on all major social media. Just type in Bright Brains with a Z. And remember, the brightest minds are those that never stop seeking knowledge.